Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation about player churn prediction using machine learning. And today uh, the presentation will take around 35 minutes and then we'll have five minutes for your questions. So if anything comes to you and you'd like to ask me, just write in, in the comments and I'll get to it at the end. And once again, thank you for coming. I hope you'll enjoy the presentation and feel free to ask. Um, the topic of today is churn prediction. So first of all, I will tell you what it is and what are the specifics in churn prediction for mobile games. Then I'll cover uh, the, the Smashing 4, which is the game that we have developed the solution for. And I'll cover some technologies that we used in our solution. Then we'll go step by step through the solution itself. And I'll end the presentation with uh, the production pipeline and with the final product. I hope that this presentation will be interesting for you, uh, even if you don't know anything about machine learning and data science. And also, I would like to, I hope I will teach something even to people that are senior data scientists and have some experience with data science. Before we get to the topic itself, let me introduce myself. My name is Nikola Valašová, and uh, I am a Faculty of Information Technology graduate. So my background is in computer science. Currently, I work as a data scientist at a Prague-based startup called Datacentix. And in my free time, my passions are fighting for diversity and inclusion and learning languages, and not only the programming ones. Uh, something about data syntax. As I mentioned, we are a product based startup and we call ourselves a machine learning and data engineering boutique. By that, we mean that we help our customers utilize their data to bring some additional value to their data and to their business. Currently, we have more than 35 data scientists and more than 25 data engineers who uh, productionalize our models and ensure that our models really help someone. And regarding our applications and our solutions, we have a wide range uh, covering computer vision solutions, recommendation systems, and uh, fraud analysis. One of the most interesting one, I would say, is the beer inspector, which you can see on the left of the slide. And it's basically a computer vision app that assesses the quality of a beer. So the quality of the froth and, and of the, the, the entire beer. Uh, and underneath it, you can see another of our computer vision applications, which is called Shelf Inspector. And it's basically an app for retailers, uh, which in a picture of uh, retail shelves, recognizes the products, recognizes price tags, and what products are next to the products that we are inspecting and what products are missing and so on. Now let's get to the topic itself. So what is churn prediction? A churn is a common term across many industries and it generally means that that a customer leaves a product for good. So uh, the churn prediction is then useful to identify such customers that are likely to leave the product and try to somehow prevent them by leaving. Uh, for example, by reaching to them via an email or sending app notifications, offering them some discounts or some pro small items for free. Uh, here you can see the standard situation. So on day one, for example, today we have a bunch of active users and consecutively each day some users become inactive or leave our product and there's no much we can do about it. But the desired situation with churn prediction incorporated is that every day we take all the users or all customers, we score them by their affinities to leaving, to quitting, to churning and we try to target these users by a marketing campaign. And with a successful churn prediction algorithm and then uh, successful marketing campaigns, 
we are able to retain more customers engaged and um, like in our product. What's specific in uh, term prediction for mobile games? In mobile games, we are trying to predict the users and the players that are likely to quit playing the game. So here you can see um, an example lifetime of a player, their activity uh, through time. So on the first day, the user downloads the game and uh, quite quickly becomes very active, likes the game, plays a lot of matches. But after some time, the game gets slightly harder. So the user spends some money to level up and to make uh, winning easier as, uh, than it is now. And after some time, which can be months or weeks, the user activity slightly decreases until uh, we lose the player at, uh, totally and the player leaves the game. So what we are trying to do is to somewhere in this gray period, in the uh, decrease activity decreasing period, we try to uh, reach the customer, reach the user, and uh, try to keep them engaged in the game. What are the specifics in mobile games or in freemium, in free-to-play mobile games, is that they are free to play. So a lot of users download it, install it, and start playing. But around 50% of all users quit playing it the same day they install it. So imagine that after the second day, only 50% of the users remain. And from uh, all the users, only 20% spend any money in the game throughout their lifetime. And from these 20%, only 10% of players are high value players, so-called whales. These are the players that bring us 50% of the entire revenue. So uh, these are the most uh, viable or the most important players to the entire game. And given how uh, low percentage of these users there are, uh, the churn prediction strategy is really important for the game to uh, keep um, the players engaged and for uh, grow growing. Now, we have implemented our solution for Smashing for Game. It is an online mobile player versus player game developed by the gaming studio Jiwa. And uh, it's basically a turn-based strategy game where you have four heroes and try to smash your opponent's heroes and deal them as much damage as you possibly can. And it's free to play. So uh, the ratios that I've shown you before apply to this game as well. So the, the low portion of people that uh, really spend some money in the game are very important to, to the game. The technologies that we use are Databricks, the Databricks environment we chose because Databricks is our partner. Uh, we developed in Microsoft Azure and we used Data Factory for orchestration. We developed the solution in PySpark because it's extremely suitable for large amounts of tabular data. And we used MLflow for storing our models and uh, comparing their individual runs. Now let me uh, see the comments. Let me know if, if everything is clear, if you're still with me, and then we can move on to the solution itself and go through it step by step. I can see Akarsha is here. Hi, hi everyone. Clear, perfect. Okay, so let's go to the solution and we'll start with data analysis. Um, first of all, I would like to show you what data we had available. So we had available three data sets, three tables. The first one was user, which contains general information about each player, such as their user ID, their login, country of origin, and for example, source, uh, which is how they came into contact with the game, either organic or after seeing an ad on Google or on some portal. 
The second table is called match and contains information about the individual matches within the game. So it has attributes such as user ID, opponent ID, date and time of the match and result, whether it was won, lost or given up because many users give up the game if they are likely to lose it. And the third table we had was called the day. It is aggregated by user ID and date. And this table offered us information about the coins the user has, uh, the coins they have obtained on each day or they have spent. So uh, the table contains additional information about the user engagement with the game. After we knew what data we have available, we did some data explorations. Uh, so we visualized uh, the data throughout time and so on. And what we found was that the player lifetime and also the level of engagement is dependent on their spendings. So when we took a look on users that have spent no money in the game, their usual lifespan was not more than a week. But uh, when we looked at the lifespan of the whales, of the players that have spent the most money in the game, their lifespan was usually months and they were really engaged in the game every day. So from this point on, we decided to focus on high value players for two reasons, because uh, they usually have enough history so that we can learn from and the machine learning algorithm can deduce uh, information from and also because of these players are the most vital to the algorithm or these are the ones that we care most about uh, meaning the uh, the retention campaign and uh, trying to keep them engaged and playing now let's move on to data pre-processing um, in data pre-processing we decided to filter out users with too short history. Again, uh, there are many, many users that have left the game the same day they installed it or just a few days after that. And we thought that the machine learning algorithm wouldn't be able to deduce any information from that. Then we filtered out users with uh, low spendings. As I've mentioned, we decided to focus on high playing users, or high paying users and um, what we did in uh, feature data preprocessing was we decided to uh, specify the target and we specified it as the answer to a question, will the user churn in the upcoming 14 days? We decided to go with 14 uh, in particular uh, after we did some analysis of the data and also for two reasons that we wanted to uh, uh, get the information of the user churning in advance so that we have enough time to send them the app notification or the email and um, prevent them from leaving before it's too late. Now we can go to feature engineering in the third part. We had two feature categories or we created two, two categories of features. The first one is static features. Uh, these are the features that are static, don't change dramatically over time. And among these are, for example, the country of origin of the user or the platform they play on, so Android or iOS. And the source, as I've mentioned, whether they've come to the game organically or via some ad. And the second was dynamic features which are um, somehow connected to the user activity and engagement in the game. So these features are, for example, the count of matches per day or um, coins spent every day on average and so on. And from these dynamic features, from each of these dynamic features, we extracted three types of values, lifetime, mood and delta. The lifetime value of each feature represents the user engagement throughout the, their entire lifetime. So from the installation date until a week ago. And a mood value, 
which represents the contemporary user activity in the game. So the past seven days. For, so for example, uh, the count of matches per day on average uh, throughout the seven days past. And with this approach, we really tried to um, get the information about the user recent behavior because uh, when we know that some user played three matches a day during the past seven days, is it a lot or is there a decrease? So um, for some user, it can be it can be an enormous activity. For another user, it can be a sign that he's totally losing interest. So we decided to split it uh, time-wise into these two categories and to really uh, grasp the difference we created a third category, which is called delta. A feature delta value is computed as the feature mood value divided by the feature lifetime value. With this um, approach, we are able to get the delta values in the range of zero to infinity, where one means no change in, in the user behavior, between lifetime and mood values. And if the delta value is between zero and one, that means that the user is slightly decreasing their activity, is slightly losing interest, possibly. And if the value is above one, that means that the user is gaining uh, activity and is becoming more engaged. Then we decided to uh, ag aggregate categorical features. Uh, I will give an example of the country attribute because with country attribute we had thousands of values, but many, many countries had only one representative uh, or two, two people in them. So we thought that the machine learning algorithm wouldn't be able to deduce any information from that. So um, what we did as the aggregation in the first step was that we took the countries with the lowest count of users, of players, and aggregated them into one common category called other. And by this, we were able to uh, decrease the number of values of the country values by half, but then we decided to incorporate another layer of, uh, of the aggregation, and that was by similarity. What I mean by similarity is that um, the ratio of churning to non-churning players. So for each country, we computed this ratio of churning players to non-churning. And then iteratively, by agglomerative clustering, we aggregated the most similar two countries together into one joint category. So for example, as you can see here, uh, the Ger Germany and Sweden are the most similar, so they were connected into one category of Germany and Sweden. Now we have the features that we need, but a machine learning algorithm requires its input to be a numeric vector. And now we have still the string uh, values. So we need to somehow encode this information for the machine learning algorithm to, to work. And this is done in three steps. The first step is applying a string indexer, which basically uh, encodes string values or categorical values into numeric ones, into a numeric representation. So uh, as you can see in the table below, uh, instead of categorical features, instead of strings, we now have a value, a numeric value. But um, if you look at the table on the left, it seems that uh, Spain is more similar to Germany than it is to the USA, or at least the machine learning algorithm could deduce so from this table if it was presented with this table. So what's important to do here is to apply one hot encoding, which uh, takes this table as an input and creates multiple columns uh, for each value of the feature, it creates its separate column and uh, that is representing the, the individual value. 
So now uh, there are no, no sort of correlations um, in between the countries and uh, the machine learning algorithm won't think that some countries are more similar than others. And the first step, third step was vector assembler. So it takes all the numeric attributes and compound, compounds one big numeric vector that can be directly in, inserted into the machine learning algorithm. And the fourth, st fourth step, uh, model training. In model selection, we tried to evaluate four types of, uh, of machine learning models which are logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, and gradient boosted trees. And to somehow compare uh, these models and pick the, best, uh, pick the best settings for each of these models, choose their best performing parameters, we used grid search. To use grid search, the entire data set needs to be split into train and validation data sets. Usually, this is done randomly. So if you imagine that we have data of users over time, like in this example, if we split the data set randomly, we would get approximately this ratio of test samples to train samples each day. But if we do the split time-wise, we are able to split the data into train and test data sets so that it uh, really simulates the real situation, the real, um, a real example that uh, it's presented in the world out there. So uh, by this approach, we are able to present the model with the historical data. And then by moving today, 14 days back, we are able to uh, present the model with the future so-called that is now annotated and we can say how well the model performed. So uh, when we split the, the data set time-wise, we are able to better assess the stability of the model and in the strength of the model over time. Um, to evaluate a model, a machine learning model, and to compare their performances or to compare the performances of two machine learning models, there needs to be some uh, metric involved. Now, there are many um, commonly used metrics, such as accuracy and precision and recall. But according to our use case, we decided to use the metric, which is called lift. Now, let me, uh, this table might confuse you, but I hope that uh, it will be clear in, in a while. The, the main idea behind Lyft is to uh, take the entire user base and uh, score each user with their probability to churning. So we get all users with their corresponding values, how likely they are to churn, to quit the game. And then we sort these users according to their probabilities so that the users that are most likely to churn are at the top and the users that are least likely to churn are at the bottom. Then we divide these users into n buckets. For example, uh, here we did uh, divide, we divided the users into 10 buckets. And uh, so that each bucket contains the same amount of users. So that's the second uh, column you can see in the table that we have 10 buckets and each bucket has the same number of players. In the next step, we compute the number of churning players for each of these buckets. So that's how we get the third column, which contains number of churning players that are in this particular bucket. Now, the fourth column contains the cumulative count of churning players. So uh, we iteratively aggregate the count of churning players to get uh, the count of players that we would hit or that, that are contained in this bucket and all buckets above it. 
and um, the fifth column, or yeah, in the fifth column, there is the cumulative percentage of churning players. The, this value is computed from the previous uh, column, and it says, okay, so if I take, um, for example, the top 50% of users, I uh, I would hit 87% of all churning users, or in, in the top 50% of users, there are 87% of the churning users contained. And the last column contains the final lift value, which is computed like this from the first and the fifth column by dividing the cumulative percentage of churning players, which now isn't just for the one bucket, for the one row, but it contains information about how, ma how many users we would hit um, in this row and all above divided by uh, the portion of samples that we covered from this row, uh, in, in this row and in all rows above. So for example, um, in the first row, we would get the value 28.3 divided by 10. And on the fifth row, we would get 87 divided by 50, which is 174. You can visualize the, the table in a graph, and it looks like this. Uh, here you can see the model performance. So uh, you can see that, for example, if we target at the top 20% of users, we would get, or if we pick randomly a user from the top 20% of our scored users, we are 3.2 times more likely to pick a churning user than if we picked randomly from the entire data set. So you can see uh, the lift of a model compared to lift of a random selection if we randomly divided the users into the 10 buckets. That would be a score of one for each bucket. Now the advantage of lift curve is that it's very suitable for marketing use cases because um, in this type of prediction, we really don't mind misclassifying someone as much as, for example, uh, in the medicinal use cases. So it's not that important that we classify some non-churning user as a churning user, but the goal here is really to increase the probability that uh, we mark a churning user as a churning user and really target the, the best way possible. And another advantage of the lift curve is that it's really, uh, it can be nicely visualized so that even clients can really understand it well uh, compared to some accuracy recall uh, numbers that usually doesn't say much. And the last uh, advantage of lift curve is to the use case that using lift curve, you can uh, easily deduce what percentage of users you want to target. So for example, uh, you say that, okay, I want to target only 10% of the entire users, but uh, I will get 4.8 uh, uh, higher probability that there is a churning user if I choose a random user, or you can say that I would like to target at 30 top 30% 30 of top users, and then uh, get a slightly lower uh, probability that every user is churning, but overall hit more churning users in the end. So. Once we did uh, the grid search over each of the four classifier types I have showed you, uh, we picked the best parameters for each and we compared the four types among themselves. And the best performing classifier type was uh, gradient boosted trees. And this was our resulting lift. It looks quite nice, doesn't it? <laughs> We were really happy with the results because um, maybe you're not so familiar with the with the results of Lyft, 
but to me this was the best looking lift i have seen in my in my career but when we looked at the table behind it we noticed that uh, 99 percent of the churning users were in the first three buckets so that might be too good to be true right so we decided to rather check our model and we picked a few random samples so we picked a few random users we took a look at their attributes at their features and at the model outcome if it makes sense then we visualize the decision trees and uh, the decision trees within a random forest. And we took a look at the most important features. And what we found out was that the model, um, the most important features to a model were some that had somehow incorporated the target in their values. So uh, the, the most churning users had the feature um, of now, because somehow uh, when we uh, created the features automatically, uh, there wasn't enough information to deduce, so uh, the mood value was simply null. And that's how the model came to such great accuracy. So we fixed the features, we fixed uh, the null values, trained all the models again, evaluated them, picked the best ones, and this was our final results. Here you can see uh, the lift before the fix in red, and in blue the new lift, the, the new results. So you can see that the results are slightly worse, but we were really happy that the model, the previous model, didn't make it into production, that we found out about the error that we've made and uh, prevented it from being really applied in a real environment. Now, this is the outcome of our entire project. Uh, it's this production pipeline, so the outcome of our uh, of our solution is not just some model but a real working solution and every day at midnight date, new data is uh, incrementally loaded from MSSQL database into Azure Data Lake storage then uh, these data are transferred into Azure Databricks where our scoring model is loaded uh, all the data is parsed features are extracted and users are scored with their probabilities of churning. And the final values are then stored back into the Azure Data Lake storage. I would love to tell you about model, model utilization and uh, about what percentage of users they decided to reach to, in what ways, uh, if they would like to reach the 10% of the most likely churning users via an app notification or via an email but currently uh, this hasn't been decided yet unfortunately so hopefully we'll know in the near future because the marketing team is currently working on it and thinking about it how to uh, do it in the west way, uh, in the best way possible so the key takeaways from my presentation today are what a churn prediction is, then uh, that train test split doesn't have to be done always randomly, but also time-wise. And the third takeaway is what a lift curve is and that it's very suitable for marketing use cases a lot more than just accuracy. And the last note from me is don't tr always trust your models and always take time to, to examine them uh, if they perform how they should. So thank you very much for listening. It was a pleasure to be here today. And uh, if you'd like to connect with me, feel free to add me on LinkedIn or email me. And also if you have any additional questions that I won't manage to answer in the upcoming five or six minutes, uh, just feel free to text me or scan the QR code where you can find my email 
um, LinkedIn and some uh, basic information about me. So thanks a lot. And I'll see if I have any questions that I could answer. Okay, hi. Oh, I would like to call you by your names, but they are so tricky and I don't want to be to, to insult you by pronouncing them badly. But <laughs> okay, are you using A-B tests or something uh, like to evaluate its performance with time? Uh, that's a really good question. But uh, due to the fact that the model is currently running but isn't used in the way it should, like uh, people are scored, but the, um, the marketing campaigns aren't targeted at them. We haven't really uh, implemented a testing, testing solution, but definitely A-B testing is a good way to go. In data centrics, we usually do A-B testing by, um, by location. So we divide by location and then, uh, yeah, I, I, guess, <laughs> I guess, you know, you can you can tell what we do with it. So uh, yeah, that's that's what we do, and that's uh, also what we would like to do with this solution, I believe, because uh, one way is or or what we want to uh, assess is the accuracy of our model, but also I can see that we would like to assess the effect how effective the targeting campaign is, like. Uh, for example, we can predict the perfect churning users and they are targeted and they still uh, remain in the application. But uh, does that mean that uh, the campaign was effective or does that mean that our model wasn't uh, predicting well and we marked a non-churning user as a churning user? So uh, the A-B testing, I believe, should give us more answers around this. And also, for example, we could do A-B testing that uh, group A is reached via an in-app notification, group B is reached via an email, and we'll see what, what works better or what's the best way to, to do the, the retention. Okay. Malak, thank you for the amazing session. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, hi, Nicola, would you be, uh, what would be your advice for freshers in data science with no technical work experience? Um, that's an interesting question actually for me because I come from computer science background. So what was absolutely new to me was the entire um, um, math behind it. And still, I think I have a lot to learn on that side, but uh, maybe you text me and I can send you some uh, tutorials to start with. Also, uh, I know a podcast which is called so you want to be a data scientist and that's directly um, directed at people who want to start their careers, careers in data science. And I believe that the author or the, the host, Misra, has some tutorials or some courses available. So that could be a good point to start. And I personally took a Google crash course, machine learning crash course, something like that which was uh, really helpful to get to know the basic terms, such as um, accuracy and, and cross-validation and what it is. So I can definitely advise that one. Turing players may get more annoyed by marketing campaigns. <laughs> That's also, uh, yeah, that would also be a good point to make A-B testing because uh, obviously if you spam users, then it's counterproductive, but also, uh, it's our work to ensure that no user is um, contacted, I don't know, twice in a day or, or every every other day that, you know, they're churning. So uh, here's some sale because that would that definitely wouldn't help. Uh, OK. I see that there was some question, but I can see it now. Well, I'll hopefully scroll up to it. I didn't understand the portion sample part. Are we dividing the whole database of players into equal amounts of buckets? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes, that's quite tricky. And uh, I'm glad you're asking. That means that you've been listening. And uh, it's, it's really tricky. I might uh, go to it back. Uh, yes, there it is. So as you can see, 
the first division is done um, that each bucket gets 10% 10, 10 of the players. So that's, that's the second column, then the third column. But from then on, um, the, each value of, on the row contains information about the row and all rows above it. So that applies also for the graph that, um, for example, in the 40, uh, yeah, the 40 portion of samples, uh, the value on the y axis contains information about the, for the, the most likely churning 40% of, of players of the entire user base. Hopefully I, uh, uh, answered your question and it's clear now if not just feel free to reach to me um, awesome talk thank you thank you diana <laughs> thank you akarsha it's a real pleasure uh, that you enjoyed the session um so i'm so excited okay perfect um why you use lift uh i hope i've already mentioned that but maybe um it would be better to repeat so there are three main reasons. And the first is that uh, we don't mind if we misclassify someone because uh, if a non-churning user is targeted by a campaign, it's not as bad as saying that a patient is healthy when they're not, you know? So the, the usual accuracy is not that important here. And uh, also, it helps us to get insight and to decide what portion of users we want to target at. And um, yeah, basically that's the most, the, the, these are the most important reasons. Also maybe because uh, this uh, solution is classification. So we are classifying users as churning or non-churning, but uh, we are not using only the true false values, but we are, one step back and we are taking the, the probabilities behind it. So, uh, and I believe that no other uh, metrics really uh, think about this, that you also can work with the probabilities instead of just the, the thresholded values. Um, okay. Hi everyone. Oh, thank you for your LinkedIn. I'll go through them and just try to add you, all of you. Um, hi, Nadia from Canada. Perfect session for me. Perfect. Okay, if I've missed a question, just let me know below. How important is feature engineering? How do you decide which model to test? Uh, feature engineering, I believe, is definitely important because, well, we, but uh, it's also on what level. Without it entirely, the model wouldn't work because uh, it wouldn't have the input ready for it. But um, definitely it's very important because, for example, in feature engineering, we covered the three time periods, the mood, mood value and lifetime value. And I think that really helped the model uh, to gain the, the ability to decide because uh, as I've mentioned, for example, if we took some lifetime value uh, of, of the entire, or, or just let's say that we took the entire lifetime and divided the total count of sessions by total number of days the user was active. So we would get for user number A, 10 sessions per day on average, user number B, user B, um, 20 sessions per day. But that doesn't give us an insight on how active they are, how active they have been before, and what their activity is right now. So I think it's really important to think um, for the model, what what could be suitable for it, and really what, what features you would like to present to it. I think it's really important as well as, as data pre-processing. I know that people talk a lot about the data pre-processing and filtering and cleaning your data. And obviously that's very important, but I think that feature engineering is as well as important. 
Uh, I see that we have one minute left, so I will answer one more question. And if we get cut out or something, then I'm sorry. And <laughs> thank you again for, for your time. Thanks a lot. Um, Chin asked, how do you manage your model experiments to ensure that the results are reproducible? Um, I think it's partially thanks to MLflow, because MLflow lets us to store the individual runs of models so that we just um, load the model and apply it to the data. But I guess that doesn't uh, really answer the reproducibility. Um, I believe that it's not so important for us to ensure reproducibility um, exactly, because um, in the real use case, that's not what happens also. You know, uh, at midnight, the model is loaded, new data are scored, and then uh, applied. So we always evaluate multiple models in multiple rounds, but uh, the reproducibility um, is, or the reproducibility of the exact same inputs are not that important to us. We want to really make the model robust so that it can handle any input uh, successfully. Can you please share the last slide? Of your, oh, okay, last slide of our contact, sure. Uh, let's scroll to it, perfect. Hopefully it's it's working. And I'll also send you my LinkedIn if you're interested. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'll send you the link to my LinkedIn directly because names are kind of complicated somehow sometimes. Okay, so that's all from me. Thank you very much for, for being here the entire 45 minutes or 50 even. And enjoy the rest of the conference and have a nice day. Bye.